Hey there, folks. Welcome back to another episode of uh, this podcast. I have uh, here with me John from Dragon Mind, and we're going to talk a little bit today about how to create engaging encounters, maybe some of the pitfalls potentially of, uh, of combat encounters, because combat is uh, one of those aspects of tabletop role-playing games that is easy to get wrong. And uh, there's probably some decent ways to... Uh, to get around those issues i don't know i've i've run enough um bad combat encounters that uh, i feel like i've done it all for you already don't repeat my mistakes so hopefully we'll we'll learn some of that but uh, the, the question that i would like to start out with is uh john what is your most let's say uh most fun uh combat encounter that you've ever run for your players that's a tough one. There are a lot that kind of come to mind, but the one that stands out most immediately at the moment is I had a combat encounter where the party was trying to fight this vampire, and the vampire was also a necromancer because I needed an excuse to have other units on the board. Um, and one of the things that my party learned kind of early on, uh, having run modules for them, is... In general, it's a good strategy to start strong out of the gate and then kind of mop up afterward. So, for example, if you're a fifth level wizard, not a bad idea if there are a lot of units clustered together to start with fireball and then right. have your archer and your rogue kind of like pick off the, the stragglers afterward. Um, and what was fun about this combat encounter in particular is I had my vampire actually be kind of smart. And what they were seeing was an illusion from the mislead spell. So when they opened with their strongest, you know, once per long rest ability, uh, they didn't hit anything <laughs> because they hadn't taken the time to figure out if it was an illusion or not. It never even crossed their mind because they were just used to winning every battle through sheer damage. Um, right. And for whatever reason in that encounter, I had a lot of um, different units. So a lot of the time to make it easier on myself, for example, like, let's say it's a vampire and they're a necromancer, so they have zombies. So I have two stat blocks to worry about, even though there are a lot of units. Um, in this one, I had ogre zombies. I had ghosts. Uh, the ghosts uh, possessed one of the characters. There is just a lot of condition changes throughout. And it because their first opening move was unsuccessful, it caused them to reprioritize which features they wanted to spend where. And because there were a lot of units, it really got them thinking about targeting in a different way as well. I think any time that you can create that sort of uh, mental shift away from what is the the least or the path of least resistance, it tends to be a more interesting uh, combat. I'm curious though, so you had a bunch of different kinds of mobs on the field. Um, did that slow down the encounter at all and, and did it matter if it did in this particular case i don't think it did and one of the reasons is i released the creatures in waves so it started with ogre zombies and then the third round of combat i threw in two ghosts and then as they were dealing with the ghosts and they mopped up the zombies i threw in whites um so rather than having all the units on the board at the same time uh I kind of like uh, parsed it out a little bit more. <laughs> and for these players, there was one spellcaster and three martial characters, which meant there was only one player that was making real complex decisions in terms of what spell is most appropriate. There have been other times I've run a similar combat with either a lot of spellcasting characters or, char or players that are a little less decisive. Um, where it could have slowed it down. So roster plays a huge role in how complex I, as the DM, feel comfortable with running certain encounters. That's a good point. Yeah, just being able to feel out uh, what kinds of encounters are going to work for your your table is uh, it makes a lot of sense. I wasn't even wasn't even considering that. So I uh, I'll, I'll I'll come back to your uh, your combat encounter. But just uh, as an example of um, something that I struggle with, I feel like, is setting health for, for monsters. Usually I'll have an idea of something that uh, 
it should work out well. It should be balanced. And then, you know, Paladin scores a crit right off the bat, dumps a bunch of, um, you know, spell slots into, uh, uh, into smite. And, and then it's just like, okay, well, half, half the encounter is gone now that you've done this thing. So there, there isn't like this gentle weakening of, uh, of the, uh, the the fight so that I can then ramp up the tension because I mean like you were saying use uh, you were using waves um, to kind of like bring more monsters into the fight and that's a, a very classic way to ramp up difficulty that doesn't overwhelm your your players and uh, but having that the opposite uh, thing occur where you're like planning on waves in this in this case it was uh, it was like an Abeleth that they were fighting which is usually a big scary creature. And, um, and I had set it up in this underwater encounter where they, like there was floating corpses that were then going to come, come to life and stuff. And there wasn't even time for that at that point. It was just, but at the same time, I have this, uh, stubbornness or this sort of inflexibility where I don't feel like I have permission to crank up the, the health value on monsters. And I'm not sure why I feel that way, but since I do, I'm sure others are out there as well. And I've designed distal with like alternate health pools so that you can just use that, that health pool and give you permission and instruction to, to do that. Um, but maybe that's just a me thing. I don't know. It's not just a you thing. Um, this really comes down to table preference and DM preference. Um, I remember uh, Cody from Taking 20 releasing a video on all the wrongs of adjusting monster HP on the fly. So his video was very much about how, you know, if your players happen to smite and bring down your big bad early, you should honor that was the story, right? You as the DM shouldn't meddle with what's been prepared. Um, and you should, in fact, congratulate your players in a way for having that happen. Um I've made it very clear to my players that I'm really able to pull off DM bull uh, on the fly, depending on how they surprise me. Um, but I mean, one uh, just to go back to the wave example, another thing I've done in in some design is create that wave within a creature. So like they go through different phases. So if you deal like 50 damage to the creature, they have some kind of transformation which changes their armor class and abilities and everything. Um, and sometimes, let's say, a party... I usually have it the opposite, where a party is usually really struggling against the first phase. So if they can't damage it to the second phase, once they hit that threshold, like, and we're getting really late at night, I'll be like, all right, you just defeated it. <laughs> I won't right. introduce that second. But it'll be ready ahead of time in case they surprise me and they deal it 60 damage or whatever in the first attack so yeah that makes sense having that sort of flexibility uh to pull the trigger on uh a phase two is something that i feel like should be baked into to more encounters because you won't always need it and but um if if the fight becomes a slog it's good to be able to shake things up um you so you brought up this example earlier of not meddling with um what, what was the article uh, I can't even remember. It was, he hasn't posted videos in a while. Um, okay. you can talk, I'll, I'll look it up. Okay. So, uh, just based on what you're saying, I haven't read it. I have really strong opinions against that because it's, well, the advice that I would give is to prioritize your players fun over what plans you had at the start and meddling as a GM is often the best way to achieve that. So if you, uh, it, which is contrast to what I was saying, where like, I, I know that I should have jacked up the health pool of the, the Abeloth encounter, just um, like I, I knew that going into it. And I was like, I can't because, because I have this weird thing um, that some sort of like weird rules is written honesty uh, that, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very strange to me, e even to me. And I know better, but uh, I think that, if you're only going to play one combat encounter per session or one combat encounter for, you know, maybe every other session in some cases, or maybe, uh, and maybe you're only meeting like once per month that, okay. Combat is one of the most 
expressive or ways to express your characters, especially in, in D&D 5e, because the vast majority of your kit surrounds that. Roleplay is is almost everything else where you can kind of just you, you talk, um, kind of make things up based on you know experiences your, your characters have. And sometimes the proficiencies that you have will like come into play. But for the most part, combat. So with that being the case, if you don't give enough time to create or to like embrace that experience, then it's not fun. Uh, or rather like, okay, Paladin gets a really hot start uh, and yay, you did it. But also there's, you know, how many other people at the table, you, they don't get the chance to play. So uh, yeah, definitely have some strong opinions about that. Metal, metal with your your games more. Just do it in a way that's consistent. And if you need permission, find ways to uh, to structure that permission kind of in advance. So I would even say that um, if you're planning an encounter and if I were to go back and do the Abeleth fight again, I would say like, okay, this is what I'm expecting them to do. And and if it doesn't work out at this point, I'm going to, this is the health pool that I'll use. That way for me, it would be more structured and I'd be giving myself permission in advance. So I'm creating a contingency, which I didn't have at the time. Absolutely. Um, by the way, the video is going to, I can't wait for you to hear it. Uh, it took me a while to find it, but the video title is Bad Dungeon Master Advice and Better Options Instead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's it's talking about the it's it's bad advice to adjust monster HP on the fly. And here's what you do instead. So I all right, I know that you said you you had a lot of like bad encounters. Uh, do you have one that you particularly liked or found fun to run? So all of the um I'll say all of the encounters that I have the most fun running in particular is, and I, I think that where the players have the most fun participating is when there's a secondary objective or when there's some other element going on. So, you know, we, we often think about um, combat is this like singular pillar of Dungeons and Dragons and this puzzle and then there's, you know, whatever. Um, why am I blanking on the, the other pillar? social uh, interaction social interaction yeah it's uh, social interaction exploration combat right so uh but a lot of times you can those are best combined with the uh there's some overlap is what i'm trying to say uh with that that combat pillar so uh one encounter that i was particularly excited by and i was only dming with one other person which i love doing because you can it's very easy to communicate talk back and forth it's, it can be a lot of fun so please Give that a shot if you haven't before. It's not as weird as it it's, as it seems um, from the outset, but uh, the encounter was that the the player was or the characters were like down um, in a underneath this city, and the city is a sort of like a magical oasis of of life amidst a, a vast desert. But nobody really knows why. At least outwardly, don't know why. But um, the source was kind of made clear when uh, underneath there's kind of like this uh, river that's infused with magic and there's this uh, these, this massive tree that's kind of like interconnected with the, the ground and it's very, very magical. Um, up on this, uh, you, so you climb this cliff to get into the arena basically of the, of the fight and up there there is a, uh, a creature, it's an archfey that is suspended over this, um, like pinned to the tree uh, like in five different places and they're suspended over this portal that has been opened within the tree and it's very, it looks very demonic and in front of that there's a Merilith uh, which a Merilith is a creature that has like what is it, six different arms so it can make all those as attacks and but my characters were low level intentionally low level and this is a very difficult, strong, powerful creature so, uh, and that's the one that they were going to fight. However, two pronged sort of, uh, approach here is that the character or the, uh, the end boss, the, the Mary Lith, didn't have all of her weapons because they were used to pin the, uh, this archfey to this tree. And the party was, it was a party of four, uh, even though I was playing with a, another or one person, we'd kind of divvied it up. It was like four or three, something like that. And, uh, the fight was intended to become progressively slightly more difficult as the Merilith um, kind of like uh, use the force to to pull a blade from the, the tree and then wield it 
Uh, so then the amount of strikes increases. So the intensity of the encounter was meant to, to ramp up. But one of the things that uh, was, was interesting is that the, the character or one of the characters was like, I'm, okay, when I pull the blades out, I'm going to throw them through the portal. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I didn't expect that. Uh, yeah, get rid of the, the weapons. Absolutely. You're still fighting a Merilith, but she doesn't have access to her entire arsenal. And then the last uh, thing that was pinning the Archfey was this uh, was something that was stabbed through the heart. And it was uh, it turned out to be an immovable rod that the the character that was like climbing up the tree needed to figure out how to uh, needed to roll a successful check to like activate it and then uh, then pull it out. And then once they did that, that was like the the last um, piece for the uh, the Jenga tower. And uh, the Archfey like gives a wink and disappears. And then like another character comes in. It was very the whole thing was very cinematic. And it was built that way so that, uh, like, there there was kind of a contingency in place in case these low level characters weren't able to to figure the puzzle out. But the fact that there was mo- there were multiple things to do in that encounter aside from just stand and bang the entire time was a really important part of why that encounter was was fun. There's got to be a better way to word stand and bang. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so st- standing there and um, and just hitting a target over and over and over is one of the least interesting things that you can do in a Dungeons and Dragons game. So please try not to make your encounters about that. Try to have some other element that gets the players to think. And uh, with also the understanding that they may not figure it out. So so what happens in that case? Yeah, you actually used a word that I frequently will tell other dungeon masters, and I think myself, which is puzzle. So the most interesting combat encounters aren't just combats, they're puzzles that you're figuring out either through the action economy or through your options. And sometimes your players will Kobayashi Maru the puzzle. And that's just part of the game where they'll throw the weapon uh, into a portal. Um, One time I accidentally disappointed my dungeon master was we were fighting this custom warrior person that he had us fighting and you know she had this huge sword that dealt a bajillion damage and like turn two i cast heat metal on the sword and she dropped it and then i had i used my free object interaction to throw it away so weapon using characters without a weapon basically are non-participants but that was one way i solved that puzzle it's it's kind of like a Breath of the Wild comes to mind where you have like the little shrines and yes, there's like an intended way that you're supposed to solve it. But because the game is physics based instead of turn based, you can a lot of times cheese the solution a little bit. And I I can see why game masters would get frustrated because basically the players figured out a way to not play the game. (laughs) Um, And when you can think strategically and like it's an unfolding puzzle I find that players are much more satisfied with victory after an encounter like that. So if they solve your puzzle, uh, be happy <laughs> that, that they did that. Be surprised. Um, and which also means that there needs to be some level of uh, detachment from your your plans so that you know that when players play the game, because it's this game in general at its baseline is meant to be an interactive uh, experience, not a video game. So, or rather a more of a social experience. So when players do really cool things, uh, make sure that those really cool things can be rewarded in a way that kind of uplifts the entire uh, combat, which is easier said than done. But uh, I think just being able to detach yourself a little bit from the result is the easiest way to achieve that. Yeah, it is interesting. The the DMs I've seen that have the most trouble with that uh, tend to be more competitive in nature, um, where if you solve the puzzle the way they wanted you to, they'll get really excited. But if there's some sort of design flaw that you exploit, um, they get a little grumpier. Part of that you can sort of blame on the 2014 version of the rules as written for some options. Like there are some options that are wildly powerful and create a larger scope than I think what they're like intended to. Um, Thankfully, I I have the feeling some of those options will be tuned a little bit better for the new 
the new player's handbook. But um, like that is it is interesting. That is one of the benefits of having a rules heavier game is you do have more like knobs to turn or levers to pull um, to try to figure out how to creatively go over solutions. Whereas for a rules light game, it can feel kind of overwhelming and uh, I don't know, a little less defined. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. You, you mentioned competitive uh, dungeon mastering. I want to make a quick sidebar. Uh, what What's your take on maybe even just that, uh, that word use? Because there's some inherent uh, connotations that are associated with it, like negative connotations. Yeah, I... The reason I use that, I've heard a lot of words to kind of describe what I'm trying to say. Um, one of which is antagonistic DMing. Um, a great example of that would be like the original Tomb of Horrors, where like there's like a fake ending and a true ending. And the only way you can get the true ending is if you like ask a specific question that's not hinted at or whatever, or there's like a random die roll. Like it's not, it's, it, has been established to be against the players. And the mm. reason I, I use the word competitive is because you can tell emotionally from where a person is off. And it's really hard to control your emotions. Like I've definitely had times where I'm like, oh, I can't wait for my players to have this narratively meaningful moment. Oh, combat encounters done. Like it's for me, it's more of a sadness that they didn't get a cool tension and release as opposed to like, you know, being mad that my monster didn't do well. But there have been times, like, I remember being a player in a combat encounter where um, the, the game master set up a counter party, very elaborate, detailed encounter. And in round one, my uh, bard cast plant growth, so his party couldn't move. And another character cast silence, so they couldn't cast spells. And then we just shot them with arrows. <laughs> so, like, and the, and the tone was definitely more like, they were seeing it as like a competition as like, mm. oh, you guys we will see how well you work together versus me, one person controlling eight different player characters. And unfortunately, the way initiative worked out and again, plant growth and silence are powerful options. They didn't get to play. <laughs> so, I, yeah, it's more of a mindset or an emotional thing than like even necessarily a mindset. Okay. Yeah, I, when I hear that term, I uh, it's is usually kind of bandied about in in like an adversarial way, um, where the the DM is overly committed to to winning, uh, which I guess competitive would kind of uh, entail. But at the same time, so I I actually view comp competitive if you were to take it in more of a inappropriate spirit uh, as and a totally justifiable way to play the game. You just have to kind of understand that uh, your table needs to be on board with that too. And I mean, the, the cards are stacked in your favor a little bit as DM, but that's like a point of restraint. Like you, you don't want the players to lose. You want to make them try to beat you is, is how I, I view it. Like you, if you were the world, you want the world to potentially be deadly and difficult and if you're if you're being too collaborative and and not challenging players enough then then that doesn't take place so i think competitive uh, in the right spirit can be uh, a lot of fun and it's it's almost it, like it could be a good thing too to have the players know where they stand against the the dm maybe not to the point where they're trying to withhold information cuz that can get a little bit weird but i uh, but if the players are like, you know, okay, DM is going to hit us hard this encounter and we, we need to be prepared for it. That is a really fun place to be as a player, you know, thinking about your preparation and knowing that things are going to be uh, challenging and difficult. So, yeah, it definitely depends on on which way you, you take it. Yeah, and it definitely again, it comes back to roster. So um, I I've told you before, so. I am currently running a very narrative heavy game, um, very involved backstories, very fleshed out world building. Um, my players in a, a lot of my players have said outright, I don't want challenging combat encounters. 
they like the puzzle solving part, but they really don't want their character to have the possibility that they'll die. Um, yeah. Which is like, you know, heresy for a lot of TTRPG community members. But the reason is because they feel the most engagement through the challenge of creating a fleshed out personality and f discovering how their character would interact with NPCs and how their character can emotionally develop. And if their character dies, they don't get to talk and see how their character emotionally develops. To them, that's the engagement, that's the puzzle, that's the challenge. So combat to them is like a narrative climax, but not there. If I were to throw a challenging encounter at them, they ne they wouldn't necessarily be excited by that because they get overwhelmed with the resource management and analyzing right. their options. That's not part of the game that they like. Now I've played at other tables. That's the opposite. They're they they're pressing the skip button on the cutscenes to get to the part where they can roll the dice and do damage and stuff. So, right. um, I. I think that both are a valid way to play and you just need to be kind of clear to get the best outcome. Okay. Quick sidebar over. Uh, are there any other encounters that, uh, that stand out for, for reasons other than we've already talked about? Maybe, uh, maybe something simple that was fun. Anything else? I, I'm putting you on the spot. I know. You are. Um, yeah. So, so you talked about the joy of DMing one person, right? Mm. Um, I'm going to go so far as to say I personally really love solo TTRPGs okay. where it's just, it's just me. I'm the game master. I'm controlling the players. I go through an adventure module myself. And uh, one of the things I like about it is as a DM, some would argue I'm too sensitive about my players like feeling bad or failing. Um, and part of that is we don't get to play very frequently. And in the martial arts world, we have a saying, you're only as good as your last class. For a lot of students, that means, you know, if you if you have like a weird moment or you end up in an argument or something, two days later, they'll come back and you can fix it, right? But for my players, that's like six to eight weeks. And I don't want them having a bad taste in their mouth that long. Um, but uh, when it comes to just me, I can put whatever risk I want. I can tell whatever. I don't have to negotiate with anyone what, with the tone of the story I want to tell. So uh, in one of these solo games, I ended up in this kind of like a Magnificent Seven scenario where uh, my single player character had to teach the village how to defend itself from the bugbears coming to attack. And some of the bullied goblins ended up siding with the townspeople and it ended up being a massacre, like on both sides. But it was simple. It was really just like for the goblins turns, I would roll, see how many attacks they got, roll how much damage they did. And then the bugbears would go and I would see how much they hit, how much the damage they did. Super simple mechanics. But narratively, as like the sole storyteller, it was kind of heartbreaking to watch these goblins just get killed after learning to be so heroic. Um, but that's what made that game so memorable as well. Did you uh, did you do journaling at the at the same time? Oh, yeah, that's that's like the only way I play now is I basically okay. played it as if I was writing a book. Just when gotcha. it comes to combat, I ran it through the game's mechanics. Okay, that makes sense. It can be a lot of fun for the for like in a, in a combat encounter that you you don't need to win necessarily, and you aren't the main character necessarily. So uh, while I was doing the the just the one on one um, DMing, the very first the very first combat encounter that I put them through was just like, oh yeah, no, there's regicide happening, and um, this is. So the, the royalty comes down into the, the plaza. There's way more guards than usual. And and then everybody starts fighting, basically. A really, really awful uh, situation. And you just need to escape. And uh, they they wanted to pick up a weapon. And I'm like, if you pick up a weapon, it's probably going to make you a target. And because they, they wanted to pick up a spear first because, like, good quality. Makes sense to do that. You can defend yourself. And, uh, and they were like, okay. Uh, you know, I'm gonna pick up this other weapon instead that I can hide um, under, you know, my my uh, robe or whatever. And just that small decision within that space of of combat, I thought added so much life to to the story that you could tell because 
you know there's now like this weirdness where the i mean the character is trying to protect themselves because they don't know everything that's going on at the same time they can get in trouble there's a lot of uh, infighting between you know different factions and they need to escape and they find the find their parents that's the the main goal actually um of that combat encounter so we still went through turn-based uh and there were other things happening like uh in alchemical uh like a potion dealer or whatever their stuff blew up and then created this line of fire across the road and then they were trying to like they're figuring out how to maneuver through the, the alleys or go over the roofs and that sort of thing so much fun uh so i don't know when you think about combat maybe don't necessarily think about it in in a way that's always to defeat someone uh think about it as an environment that um that your characters are just trying to protect themselves in yes <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what i got um yeah no i i'm definitely a fan of of secondary objectives um giving your players an out but letting them be defeated every now and again um another really memorable combat encounter i remember running was uh the lord of blades from eberron um and the characters were like level six or something um and i just threw him in <laughs> and it was a pretty simple straightforward encounter but his stats were just way better than theirs and they could not out damage him um, and he started just dropping them. And, and I, I, gave, I opened a portal and let them escape or whatever. Uh, but in terms of meaningfulness, they had enjoyed the campaign so far. But that defeat was the thing that made the players motivated to learn their mechanics better. Because they realized that there were a lot of blind spots. In ter- there were things they could have done to defeat him. They just They had been used to damage being the thing that lets them win. So by being defeated by a more cunning, even though it was a more straightforward encounter, um, opponent, emotionally, it changed how they approached combat encounters. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Using combat as a as a way to add some stakes to the overarching story or like some investment. Yeah. So like random encounters can sometimes fall flat because you because they aren't tied to anything and if if you read any like fantasy novel the reason that the character is there is because there is a situation that they're a part of and the circumstances might be kind of wild and random but it what it ultimately does even in those like weird one-off situations is that it helps propel either a portion of their character forward or maybe slow them down to from you know achieving some other objective that they need so it should your encounters should I, I keep saying should, but it depends on the type of game that you're running. Um, if you're running a, a longer campaign style format, try to make them uh, have a reason for being instead of uh, random. You know, allow them to uplift the story overall in some way. Absolutely. Um, on the subject of random encounters, uh, I personally don't use them ever uh, because one of the things I find leads to the best or leads to the most enjoyment from my players is allowing them to go to bed on time. So I have a very kind of strict time window that I try to fit the story in. And I've gotten pretty good at timing and adding in random elements like that uh, just jacks with that timing. Um, So, however, I can see the value depending on the agreements that you have with your players being that, you almost create random encounters that are meant to be there and specifically convey the uh, something happening within the dungeon or in the environment that the player is in. Um, and the randomness is whether or not the that monster is in the room that your players enter. So rather than like a table of just being like, ah, oh, two oozes or ah, oh, a skeleton, <laughs> like you, you have like kind of specific monsters that are there for a purpose ahead of time. It's just which ones are they going to happen to come across? And like you said, the, the function of that could just be resource draining. Um, so there have been plenty of times in fantasy stories where a, a character is well equipped and then because of some situation i don't know they lose their uh their camping supplies or they they lose their weapon and now they have to make do that's where so sometimes random encounters themselves may not support a story thing but it may affect 
a character's ability to successfully navigate a future encounter that's more meaningful. Uh, when you when you brought that up, uh, just the resource management, I was thinking of the the Green Knight and how they they set out like fully decked. You know, your your shield is blessed, um, and I think they had a weapon and like a, a belt, and uh, they lose these things just from like the random encounters uh, along the way. I th- I'd love that. I'd love that. Um, cool. So why don't we do some just to to wrap it up, some lightning round stuff, where uh, we'll go back and forth. One tip uh, that a that somebody trying to create an encounter or run an encounter could use, and we'll, we'll try to keep it simple. Uh, if if you'd like, I can start. Yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. So the the one tip that I I would give is you can create a more varied encounter by implementing more creatures. However, so a lot of people say that, okay, you know, you need like three different uh, types of characters, you know, one from range, one melee, you know, maybe one to to control to to make an encounter uh, feel dynamic. The the downside of that is is difficult to juggle stat blocks. And if you find things that even if the character is cool, I would like pare them down almost to the stuff that you know you're going to use and uh so so it could still be snappy because slow combats make it just diminishes the um the mood of everybody all right on that note um if you have a big boss give him minions uh i won't spoil it but the standout thing so baldur's gate 3 uses 5e mechanics at the end of act 2 there's a big boss fight I that was the easiest encounter of the game <laughs> because I didn't have any minions to deal with. I could just target the one thing and I a- out action economy the boss. Um, happened every playthrough. Uh, okay, that surprises me still that you had such an easy time doing that. And maybe it's because I didn't like strongly multi class um, during my first playthrough, and and maybe my composition wasn't the best, but. But that that combat was not. I I didn't get the achievement until the second go around. Yeah, I'll say that. I don't know. I just it just couldn't do anything. It would it right, would do something. Dude. I'd heal. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that like again when I, I even recently I run a combat encounter with one big boss. Player steamroll it as soon as I add in like a few competent lieutenants. All of a sudden, it's much more interesting. Um, so that'd be my lightning round advice. Cool. I, I think that you can uh, make a combat encounter more interesting if you add something to the room, some sort of asset that contributes to the fight in some way. So if there's a, uh, I, I guess just even a, a secondary objective. So like there is a talisman at the bottom of the lake or something that the that the ghost that you're fighting or want or maybe uh, it's it's what's keeping them alive or summoning more and that sort of thing like put that secondary objective in because then you have to decide um, who's going to stay and fight and then who's best suited from your party to go take on the challenge of of retrieving you know said amulet or moving the heavy object or hitting the crystals or whatever it is yeah uh, to go off of that uh, give obvious narrative clues <laughs> so the more information you withhold from your players the less they'll interact with that information because they don't know it so if uh if you want there to be some kind of puzzle element uh it's on you to tease out the information that's going to get them uh interested in utilizing those puzzle elements to to build off of that in the the element of surprise uh, has never really worked out to the the same degree as just like giving them more information, basically. Uh, and part of that comes from like maybe it's your delivery of the clues. Maybe you're relying on something that happened, you know, sessions ago, which could just be months back. You know, depending on how often you play. And uh, erring on the side of giving more information uh, also helps with people who have. I guess, uh, like neurodivergent, you know, uh, methods of, uh, of processing information 
or just you know if they if they just learn differently than you or if they or if you're over an internet connection that you know something blanked out uh, and they just didn't catch it so uh i mean even when it comes to dcs even i think it's, at least it's safer um to even give that information up front so that people don't think that their attempts are all ineffectual totally gotcha uh just just an example of that real quick um i was playing in a in a like a it was supposed to be a difficult campaign we were told that up front and after a while this is like session nine or ten i went to the dm and i said hey will any control abilities ever actually work and what they said is why would you say that and i'm like well every time our bard casts a spell or our wizard does something it always fails it has never worked in 10 sessions of the game and what they said was, well in this world they protect their mind so they have high wisdom saves but they have low intelligence saves and i'm like all right which of our party members has a spell that affects intelligence saves this was before tasha's um and so the design made sense in their head, but they hadn't communicated that. It wasn't obvious. And like, also we didn't have an option that actually allowed us to take advantage of the exploit that they had designed in. So just to go off of what you said, be abundantly clear. And even if you have to use mechanical terms that actually helps the narrative, it does not distract from it in my experience. Yeah, uh, even just figuring out what your party is capable of and then giving them creatures that they're actually good at fighting makes, I mean, you, you can pepper in one that, that they have to change the strategy for, but if there's something there that they're like, uh, that they excel at, at killing or like one party member does is he's just really good at, maybe it's like a, a ranger who has some sort of, you know, uh, special affinity with dealing with undead or, or whatever, um, give them, uh, give them reasons to, to key in on a specific type of creature or a specific, you know, uh, element of a, of a puzzle, you know, if like a, just to go back to the underwater thing, if one of them's a Triton, it can breathe underwater, obvious choice, right? Make them feel good about what they're doing instead of like they're, uh, stifled at every turn. Hey, speaking of underwater and speaking again of Baldur's Gate, uh, just, I found my players like when the environment matters. So for example, if there's like, I don't know, a pool of water that they're standing on and your character casts lightning bolt on the water, it does extra damage. Doesn't even have to be a lot of extra damage, like two or one D four, but just any little reward for that, for showing how their options interact with the environment, um, really leads to a lot more strategic gameplay from them. I think I know we're just building, um, but to to build off of that, 5e um, has a very strong, easy to implement, uh, very understandable mechanic for when you can take advantage of something. Just give if somebody's standing in in a, a pool, you don't know how much additional damage to do. Give them advantage on the attack. It's not going to break the game because, quite frankly, advantage happens way too much um, as it is. But point being, that's that's kind of the reason that it exists is to uh, reward, you know, clever use. Totally agree. Uh, this is another environmental one, but one I always forget. Uh, like just if they're outside, uh, play with the weather. Um, so if it's like raining, maybe it's difficult to rain just because it's wet on the ground. Or if it's foggy, you know, they're going to have a harder time with perception checks. So yeah weather matters too uh i think one for me would be build an encounter that just as a point of practice build an encounter that you are uh unfamiliar with but don't make it overly complex because it's gonna help teach you what you're capable of doing and also test your players with what they're capable of um uh, understanding or you know uh, acclimating to a good example to, to build on the weather one is like, okay, there's an avalanche that takes place mid encounter. Like, you know, do something like that to, uh, to, to help shake things up. And, uh, it, it doesn't put so much pressure on you to, to make the monsters work. Yeah. You'll be a lot happier with the complexity of your encounters. If you think of a series of encounters as teaching your players, 
So assuming you've got brand new players, you don't need to start with a complex encounter. You can start with, these are the skeletons, and you just need to run up and hit them so that they can learn how their actions work. And then maybe the next one, some of the skeletons have bows. Oh, so having that, you know, progressive complexity, but also paying attention to not add complexity before your players are ready. I still have players I've been playing with for like six or seven years, and they're still asking me, oh, how does sneak attack work? And it's not like, oh, man, you're a bad player. You haven't done your homework. It's just like, oh, let me use this part of the encounter to remind you how it works. So they get more and more practice with it. So they remember it better and better each time. Yeah. All right. You have anything else left uh, in the chamber? Good. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Hopefully you uh, got something out of that. Um, I think we're, that's where we'll end it. Nice and short-ish. Uh, if this video has been interesting, helpful, or entertaining, please feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I don't think that's really effective, especially at the end um, of a of a video like, you know, anyway, thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.